At the very end of each year, when the southerly busters drive north from the deep Antarctic and the nor'easters sweep in from the Pacific, yachtsmen from all over Australia gather in the fastness of Sydney Harbour to begin one of the most grueling ocean races in the world, the 680-mile Sydney to Hobart Yacht Race. Down along by the foreshore, where city shadows and stately homes merge in curving green, the coves and anchorages around the harbour come alive in the early morning as the competing yachts are given their final check and their ration of rum. The city, too, waking abruptly from its Christmas sleep, pours forth eager crowds and spills them round the shores. There's an air of excitement about this festive Boxing Day as they wait for the yachts to move out onto the harbour. Sweethearts and families may not see their men back in port for several weeks. It can be an anxious wait. Like a skimming gull, an aircraft drops low to spy on the ferries circling the edge. Reaching across the water, out of the wooded shores, the spectators come in their steamers, workboats and little tin tubs to mingle in mid-morning sunlight with the strong, sleek hulls of the ocean racers. Facing the harbour up and down, up and down, restlessly manoeuvring, waiting, counting the minutes off one by one. Landlubbers gaze from shore with long eyes, watching competing yachts and spectator craft cross and recross and merge together, until someone misjudges. Ripe seafaring language gives way to anxious thoughts. But help is near, and there's no stopping. The gun is only seconds away, and all eyes converge on the starting line. Five seconds to go. Four, three, two, one. And over the line. Tall ships and small ships, all in together. Schooners and catchers, and cutters and sloops. They slide seaward in a flow of white canvas. From the starting launch, the governor waves good luck and good sailing. Out of the pack, they speed close hauled in a headlong rush to the sea. Alongside, the spectators hurry and tumble and cheer the yachts on their way. Yachts like little Samuel Pepys, who won the transatlantic race. And on rust that sailed across the world. Names and ships that stir the imagination. Wraith of Odin, Four Winds, Tamashanta, Karua Four, and Mistral Two. Down the lee shore and out with the tide. Through the nor'easter and hard for the heads. Like gulls disturbed, they spread across the bay, pursued by the steamers dropping behind. The crowds look their last, and the final company of well-wishers and the curious slip away. South head to starboard and Sydney astern, the tall ships emerge in scattered file for their first taste of what is to come. The escorting police boat turns in a farewell salute, and the yachts are on their own, southward and outward bound. The sea route to Hobart covers a direct 680 miles, but it will be nearer 900 for most as they scatter out to sea. The longest course may be the swiftest when the hard southerlies blow. It's a battle of tactics and a gamble with sea and winds. Some take the chance of the moment to run with the wind and haul aloft the long cocoon, which, unfolding, blossoms and curves and bends around the breeze. And drawing full and light with grace, she passes down the swell. But not all run softly. With sheets hard in and sails trimmed, others stand well out on a compass course, 
on the first leg of a long tack, to turn again, perhaps, in two days' time. All day long, with scuppers awash, the Nile slides swiftly astern, while those on watch and those off watch take their ease in the afternoon sun or cut a neat curve around the evening meal. Below deck, wedged tight in his little galley, the cook too has been busy, and the first watch of the night sits down to a welcome meal. And the yachts sail into the night, and through the night. In between watches, the crew snatch some sleep, ready to hurry on deck. Timbers creak, sheet locks rattle, footfalls sound through the planks as the wind veers about into the dawn. A change of wind means often a change of sail, and the watch is kept busy hoisting canvas to make best use of the new breeze. And so time passes. The yachts sail steadily southward, flung out far and wide, with only an occasional freighter steaming over the edge to break the lonely expanse. They sail through brief sunshine, when eating on deck is a rich delight, and when a tune at dusk is a companionable thing and passes the time away. And through squalls, sharp winds and tumbling seas, on through the cold south waters and into Bass Strait. With log line trailing to measure the speed and the sun in the sextant's sight, the navigator below deck carefully plots the ship's track. Her position is relayed to the mother ship, standing guard somewhere among the fleet, or to Hobart Radio. Calling Hobart Radio. Carawa calling Hobart Radio. Our position 127 miles southeast of Gogo Island. Over. Hobart Radio to Carawa. Roger your position. Here's a gale warning. A deep depression centered 100 miles south of Hobart, causing strong to gale force winds over southern waters, where west to southwest winds force 7 to 8 and rough to very rough seas. a shiver down every man's back. With the ship luffed up to the wind and the boom sheeted hard in, all hands make speed to shorten sail and tuck in a good strong reef. Up forward, the headsails come down. The storm jib goes up in their face. Anything can happen in these southern waters, and it often does. Hardly a race passes without its casualties of broken limbs, caught by a lashing spar or a wild jive, or a man overboard, hurled from the deck by a sweeping wave. Sometimes a yacht dismasted, wallowing in huge seas. Times often when a yacht is isolated from all help because a wave has struck out its radio and it must wait helplessly until the race is finished and its absence noted. A 
not all yachts carry radio, and nothing may be heard of the smaller craft until they turn up in port again. The lashing storms of Bass Strait are well known and respected. It will be a growing test for every craft and every man. Through a long day and a tortured night, the wind howls and the seas heave. A cold dawn searching the grey waste finds the smaller yachts hove to, riding out the dying storm. In the quiet of the aftermath, there's the blessed reward of a few hours' sleep, or a snooze in mild sunlight across a drying deck, while a friendly albatross hovers above and soars down the sky. Often there is storm damage to be made good, and torn sails must be patiently stitched and patched, ready to go up again should the need arise. The rigging too, stretching, working loose, sometimes snapping under the terrible strain, must get running repairs high aloft from the bosun's chair. And now it's time to turn landward. The helm goes up and the bow swings across, and the ship bears ten west of south. The hours roll away through the watches until across the blue water, mutton birds rise in a swarm, a sign that Tasmania's coast is near. A murmur of excitement runs through the crew. They wonder who might be ahead and who is astern. And they wonder too if the landfall is a good one. Behind them, other yachts turning inward sooner have made their landfall further north by Eddiston Light or Fresenay Peninsula. They move down the coast, sometimes close in shore, past rocky outcrops where a skilled eye might find a private band of wind. They all make for Cape Pillar, the high rocky shore that Abel Tasman, Ferno and Cook, explorers of the past, first gazed upon. Fluted cliffs, harsh and raw, that looked down upon the first stirrings of time. Cliffs that hung over the ages and the everlasting sea. They stand a lofty guard across Storm Bay and across the yachts that pass beneath, on the last run for Hobart, 50 miles ahead. Out from Hobart, an aircraft flies seaward to catch first sight of the yachts as they draw near, sometimes days apart, sometimes with only a mile or two between them. One by one, the ocean and Storm Bay give up their ships as they pass by the Iron Pot Light into the River Derwent and into the sight of the man on watch. And come at last to the quiet waters of the harbour where the city of Hobart, spread under the foothills of Mount Wellington, waits, ready to acclaim the first across the line. It's the end of a long, hard slog, and a victorious one. An exciting moment, as much for the crew as for the spectators who crowd the dock 
to absorb secondhand those experiences the yacht represents. The crews are amateur, men from all walks of life who race time and again for their own satisfaction. Out on the harbour, the second yacht home moves gently across the line, in contrast to her earlier buffeting. Through the days that follow, and the nights, the fleet, one by one, makes its way into harbour. It's a glad sight for relatives and friends as the yachts with their men cross the finishing line. And it's a triumphal moment for the men who dared the storms and lashing seas, danger, and the hardship of little sleep and poor food, and uh, seasickness, a word not spoken too loudly. Now, with all the yachts accounted for, and a bath and a shave in sight, it's time for cleaning up and drying clothing and bedding that's been wet for most of the race. And a time, too, for recounting experiences in the lull before the festivities to come. The most significant of these is the prize giving, where valuable trophies await, among others, the first across the line, the winner on corrected time, and even the cook of the last boat home. But for the men who sail in the Sydney Hobart yacht race, winning is not so important. It's the comradeship, an affinity with sea and wind, and some quality that draws them out to pit their skill and lives against the forces of nature. A quality that seems common to all men who challenge the sea in ships.